Coming up next, we have got I, I, Dr. Kent Hoven. Wait, wait, it's probably. Hold. hold up. What you got? I got the dog tags. Oh, sweet. We're I all good. I forgot to mention those. They tried to kick us out earlier. Oh. And now we yeah. have a dog tag. You have to have this to stay in. Forgot about that. That's very important. I was every, out there for like an hour. Every single session. They didn't let you in, huh? You no. You go get this? No. My goodness. Every no. single session, make sure the ushers, as you come in, they can see your dog tag, all right? So make sure they can get that. And the kids, too. Yeah, and the kids, as they go to Creation Cadets, this is how we know they belong to us and not to somebody yes. else. Otherwise, Without the dog tags, they, they kick get them the boot, outside okay? with the rest of it. So, okay, and good. So you um, could wear that now. We're all paid okay. up. The $28. We're paid up. It's all good. Hang on, $28? bucks. Yes, $28. You got these for $28? bucks. Yeah. How did you do that? Well, that's what the lady told me. With the, see, well, there's like 13 sessions, right? And you, like $7 a session at 28 bucks. And so I'm going to be hey, out. Hey, what, what, the, wait, wait, wait. Dude, you paid $28 and got these things? Yeah, yeah. 13 20. sessions at $7 a piece and you paid $28. That's right. Dan, pretty smart. let me get to the bottom of this. Dan, 7 yeah. times 13 is not 28. Yeah, it is. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Did you go to public school? Yeah. Uh, that explains what. Let me show you. Is there a chalkboard around here? Hey, yeah, grab that chalkboard. I'm just going to show you. 7 times 13 is not 28, okay? Well, I don't what know about it? the new fancy math they may be teaching you guys, but. <laughs> no, it, it, trust me, it's um, not 28. Let me just show you here. Got that? Okay. All right, Dan. Thank you, guys. Give it a hand for the, give a hand for the stage hands. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. All right. Okay, you got 13, right? 13, yes. Times 7, seven. Yeah. equals 28, right? Do the math there. I don't think you're going to come up with 28. You'll see what it really oh. is. Oh, all right. Uh, okay, okay. Um, okay, 7 times 3 is 21. 21. All right, okay. you take 7 times 1. 7. 7. That's right. You got 7 plus 1. It's 8. Bring down the 2. 28. 28 bucks. Isn't that what everybody else paid? Right? Okay. $28. No, Dan, that's not how you multiply. Yeah, it is. All right, check it out. Check I just it out. did it what right if, What if you did it the opposite way? What if we did um, seven, 7 times 13? No, we just did so 13 times 7. Let's just start oh. dividing. What is 7 mm -hmm. divided by 28? Now, right. see if you come up with 13 there. Okay. What is 7 into 28? Right. What do you get? I've been out of school a while now. Yeah, I can tell. Let's see. <laughs> Okay, we'll first of all, the 7 is not going to go into the 2, right? right? So you have to bring the 2 down here. Now the 7 into the 8 goes once, all right? So 1, right there. So then 7, and then you subtract 7 from the 8, you have 1. So now you're doing the 2, you carry the 2 back. 7 into 21 is 3. You got 13, 28 bucks. <laughs> no, it's all good. I'm gonna, Dan. I'm gonna go. Oh, out Dan, Dan, whoa, we're not done yet. Dan, that is not how you divide. No, that's how I divide. All right, right forget, the, forget the multiplication and division. Do you know how to add? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's add this up here. Add this up. You got 13, that's one. 13, 13, 13. This makes sense. 13, right? 13. 13. Right. All right, simple math. Elementary, my dear Dan. Right. Add that up, what do we got? You got 3, 6, six 9, nine 12, 15, 18, 21. Hey, look, Hugh Ross. 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. Uh, <laughs> got 28 bucks. I'm going to go ahead and I'll be outside for the. Wow. Uh, can I just say that there are a lot of stupid people out there? <laughs> In our world today, there are a lot of uh, really, yeah, stupid people. Man, and some people just have stupid ways of adding and dividing and multiplying. It just doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. It's amazed me. Two people can. They really can. They can look at the same thing, and one gets some stupid idea about what just happened. It's absolutely incredible how that works. Well, here to talk to us about evolution and why evolution is so stupid... <laughs> is Dr. Kent Hoven from right here in Pensacola, Florida. Let's give him a hand. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. All right. Thank, you, son. Thank you. Amen. Okay. Let's see. Did I get it on here? Y'all been sitting a long time. Everybody stand up, turn around twice and sit down. Go, go, go. Let's go. 
This is boot camp. If you got to go potty, that is tough, okay? <laughs> We're glad you're here today. All right. This is our first boot camp. My son, Eric, I think has done an amazing job of organizing things. I've been traveling a lot. Thank you, son. They asked me to speak tonight on why evolution is stupid. I can't think of an easier topic on the planet to speak on. Now, keep in mind, one of the goals of our boot camp is to train people to be better soldiers. You may already believe in creation, that's great, but you've got neighbors who don't. We are unashamedly at our ministry for evangelism. I'm not against ministries that want to, you know, teach you things and provide education or provide answers. I do that too. I want to favor that. But without apology, we want to use the creation message as a means of evangelism. We want to get people saved and we want to train you to do the same thing. That's the goal of getting people converted. It doesn't do any good to fill their head with good stuff if you don't get their heart converted over to the Lord. I'm not against the intelligent design movement. I think it's great. I don't think they're going far enough. I'm not part of it. I wouldn't fight them for a second. But I want to go way beyond that. I want to lead them all the way to the cross and get them saved. So that's the goal here. Okay. Why evolution is stupid. Now, before we start, this is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. And uh, we live right here in Pensacola, Florida. You'll be at our place tomorrow at Dinosaur Adventure Land. I live right on property. I live in Building 2. Building 3 is our offices. Building 4 is the Science Center. Building 5 is the museum. We're real original around our place. I have three kids, one of each. <laughs> and I got them all married, and the dog died. Praise God, I made it. I'm home free. It's wonderful. <laughs> and all six of them live right around me and got four grandkids so far. And for those that don't know, that's God's reward for not killing your own kids when you thought about it. Hang, hang in there, parents. It'll be worth it all someday. It's really wonderful. All of them work in our ministry, and all of them want to serve God with their life. And I wouldn't take anything for that. Okay. We got quite an interesting tribe. We got uh, somebody said, how many people work at your ministry? I said, uh, about half of them. <laughs> Some days less than that, but uh, we got an amazing staff over there. You get to see them tomorrow. I think it's 45 now, but I honestly don't know, okay? Nor does it matter. It's not enough. I could use a couple more. But... Boot camp. The purpose here is to get people booted and get them excited and do something for God. We hope to do this every year. We're going to have a questionnaire for you to fill out tomorrow with things you can answer, questions like, is this a good time of year for you to have a boot camp? We wanted to have it in September, but it got a little windy around here, and so <laughs> we decided we better move it to a different time. So you'll be able to do that tomorrow. Don't forget that. There are two opposing philosophies of life, creation and evolution. These two views cannot be more opposite. Okay? And if you're going to be a good soldier, you have to understand your enemy. What do they do? How do they behave? What do they believe? You've got to get inside the head of the enemy. How many of you have spent time in the military? Anybody spent time in the military? Look at that. Okay. Well, you understand that's part of the training. You've got to get yourself in condition. You've got to know your facts. You better learn how to take that rifle apart and put it back together in about seven seconds. So you'll be doing 4,000 push-ups. Okay? And you better understand your enemy. You better know their weapons. You better know what they believe. I've done 92 debates now at universities. My first one was 15 and a half years ago when he first moved here to Pensacola, 16 years ago. They asked me to come do a debate at the University of West Florida. <clears throat> I had been writing letters to the editor in the local paper about uh, how dumb evolution was because I'd just been here a few months and an article came out in the paper that said, dinosaur bones found in Montana from 80 million years ago. I thought, hey, I'm new in town, might as well stir up trouble, you know, so I... I wrote my first ever letter to the editor and said, they found dinosaur bones in Montana, but they're not from 80 million years ago. These are dinosaurs that drowned in the flood in the days of Noah. Amen. Well, man, you would have thought I had shot the sacred cow. <laughs> I got called everything but a white boy for the next six months in the local paper right here in Pensacola. <laughs> and finally, the university called me up, one of the people in the debate team there, and said, hey, you've been writing a lot of stuff about creation. Would you be willing to come debate one of our professors who believes in evolution? Well, I had never had a debate in my life except with my wife, and I lost those every time. <laughs> How many understand what I'm talking about? Okay. <laughs> so I, I was not excited about that, but I went out there and debated that guy. He'd been teaching evolution for 20 years, and it was an absolute slaughter. I couldn't believe they were that dumb. <laughs> After 92 debates now and being turned down over 4,000 times, people have face-to-face -face refused to debate me on creation and evolution. I have decided they are all that dumb. They really are. Evolution is, is stupid. But this is a serious doctrine, though. 
It's not only one of the dumbest, it's one of the most dangerous religions in the history of planet Earth. See, if creation is true, God created man. If evolution is true, man created God. If creation is true, man brought death into the world. If evolution is true, death brought man into the world. These two views cannot possibly be more opposite. Evolution teaches we're getting better, and someday we get to be God. I cover more on that on my video part five, the dangers of the evolution theory. God said, or Satan said to Eve in the Garden of Eden, hey, if you eat off that tree, ye shall be as gods. That's where the evolution idea got started. But God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And Satan says, no, I want you to become God himself, okay? Before the flood, the Bible teaches people lived over 900 years. I believe you could learn an awful lot in 900 years. Many people have never even thought of this, but do you realize Adam spoke every language in the world? Because <laughs> there was only one. The uh, Bible says we're made in God's image and we're getting worse. Things are not getting better. Things get worse with time, okay? <laughs> if creation is true, man's made in God's image. The original man was huge, smart, disease-free, and designed to live forever. Man sinned and messed up the whole thing. If evolution is true, man evolved from animals without a creator or a designer. Original man was small, dumb, poorly designed, doomed to die early, and millions of years of death brought man into the world. These views, I'm telling you, are, are polar opposite. Somebody's wrong. And I enjoy showing them who they are, okay? So, <laughs> what about the cavemen? Where on earth do they fit into the picture? We teach the kids, this is grandpa. Is it possible for an ape-like creature to turn to a human? <laughs> well, we cover a whole bunch more on the cavemen on our video, videotape number two of our blue series of tapes out there on the table under the, uh, under the stairwell. I like to ask evolutionists this question. I say, guys, here we have Mount Rushmore, which is, as far as I know, the world's largest rock group. Um, do you think it's possible for the face of George Washington to appear on those rocks by chance? Do you think the wind could have done that? Could that have happened by, you know, abrasion or erosion or exfoliation or thermal expansion of the rock? I mean, what caused the face to appear on the rock? And they'll say, oh, this was designed by a guy named Borglum, and he took a long time and he built it. Okay. Now, guys, do you believe George Washington himself, the original real George Washington, with 50 trillion cells in his body and over 20 systems that we know of that are all interdependent on each other, do you believe the real George Washington happened by chance? They'll say, yeah. I say, wait, wait, wait. You don't believe his face could appear on a rock by chance, but you do think his, his entire complex anatomy could happen by chance. Are you dumb in any other area? <laughs> Was there a designer for that? How about just a car, a simple car? Do you think that was designed, or could that just happen by chance? This is nothing compared to one single cell in your body. Could a big, could a, can a box evolve? Joyce saw my seminar years ago and wrote this book. It's so cute. It gets so simple. Can an ink pen evolve, you know? Could just a needle evolve to sew your clothes up with? You know, it just goes through simple things. You realize, no, that could not evolve. The DNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid in your body, is the most complex molecule in the universe. It is unbelievably complex, the DNA is. Was there a designer for that? Or did it just happen by chance? The Casio databank stopwatch. Mine holds 300 phone numbers. It's a calculator, it's a countdown timer and a stopwatch. And an alarm clock, it does not tell time. I have to look at it. But this is an amazing machine, okay? <laughs> Do you think this thing could have happened by chance? You don't have to see the designer to believe he exists. The watch itself is proof there was a watchmaker, whether you ever see him or not. It's interesting, evolutionists argue against design using arguments they designed. <laughs> Michael Behe's got a great book on the uh, design of the single uh, cells in your body. He spends an entire chapter talking about the hair on a bacteria. One single hair on a bacteria is unbelievably complex. It's attached to a little tiny motor. That motor is in the skin of the bacteria. That motor turns 100,000 RPM. We've got a model of it you'll see tomorrow at Dinosaur Adventure Land. That motor is so tiny, if you took one hair off your head and chopped it off, eight million of the motors would fit on the stump. It turns 100,000 RPM. And it's so powerful, it's able to make that bacteria swim 
the equivalent of a person, a human, swimming 60 miles an hour through peanut butter. That's how powerful that motor is. It is just phenomenal. And you think it happened by chance? Come see the model at night. Is he, did Ian Juby make it in? Ian, are you here tonight? He was going to come. He built the model for us. He said he'd come and be, here tomorrow. be here tomorrow. Had transmission trouble coming down from Canada. Any more Canadians? Yeah. Canadian. Hey, 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 hey. Okay, good. Canadian, eh? Do you think there might have been an intelligent designer for the model? I mean, just the model took an intelligent designer. Ian's part of the Mensa Club. I mean, really intelligent. The, but this is child's play compared to the real ones. That's just, there had to be a designer, okay? There's a rock, but on the side of the rock, you know, to say there's uh, somebody carved something on there. I mean, we'd all agree with the rock is probably a natural thing, but uh, what about the design on there? Nobody with half a brain would say, well, that, that just happened by erosion. No, that was designed, okay? You see a bunch of rocks arranged in a particular order, you automatically conclude somebody designed it. Look, if you're walking through the woods and you find a painting hanging on a tree, you look around, there are no people, there are no footprints. You holler, hey, anybody out there? Nobody out there? And uh, you, see, you can't find anybody of any evidence of anybody having ever been there. What do you conclude? <laughs> Somebody made the painting, right? The painting itself is proof of the painter. Do you think our dinosaur adventure land is a result of just chance? Did the wind blow through there and assemble everything? I can assure you that is not how it happened, okay? <laughs> Everything in this world is evidence of design. Do you think a little baby is evidence of design? Do you think that could have happened by chance? The creation view says very clearly that God made everything 6,000 years ago. 4,400 years ago, there was a big flood. A guy named Noah built a big boat, put all the critters on board, and everybody outside, their property value dropped to zero. And if you couldn't swim for a really long time, you had a real problem on your hands, okay? The evolution view says 20 billion years ago there was a big bang where nothing exploded and produced everything. Somebody is clearly wrong. People say, isn't there a third position? Couldn't God use evolution? Well, the God that would use evolution is cruel, wasteful, stupid, and deceitful. It's not the God of the Bible, that's for sure. Jacques Monod said, natural selection is the blindest and most cruel way of evolving new species and more and more complex and refined organisms. It's a horrible process. He said, an ideal society is a non-selective society, one where the weak is protected, which is exactly the reverse of the so-called natural law. He said, I'm surprised a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process that God set up. Why would you blame God for the process of evolution? That's cruel, it's mean, it's awful, it's horrible, and there's no evidence for evolution anyway. So why should I take my perfectly good Bible, which has never been proven wrong, and compromise it with a dumb theory that has never been proven right? I'll stick with what I got, thank you, okay? So, we could... Evolution is stupid. I'm going to tell you why. Here's Discover Magazine. Where are we going? Straight to hell if you don't get saved, okay? But... <laughs> stupid. Dictionary definition. Lacking normal intelligence. Foolish. A stupid idea. I collect textbooks. You get to see those tomorrow if you get a chance to come in our library. We, I have hundreds... <laughs> My wife says too many. I said, I don't, I don't have them all, so how could I possibly have too many? Okay? Um, you got to get them all till you get too, too, and one more than that, then you got too many. Um, Richard Dawkins says, it's absolutely safe to say if you meet someone who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. Well, you got to define evolution. The first thing I do when I do debates, and if you're going to be a good soldier for the Lord out here in this evolution battle, and it is a battle going on, you're going to have to d define exactly what you're talking about. I've watched in the last 15 years, probably nine states have tried to force creation into the schools or drag evolution out of the schools or force equal time. They're all barking up the wrong tree. None of those are going to work. Even what's going on in Kansas now, even though I'm thrilled for what they're doing and go get them, guys, it's not going to work, okay? The simple solution is you have to define what you're talking about first. They're not defining. Alabama did a pretty good job on the sticker they had in their textbook years ago because they defined, they separated the evolution into the different kinds. Somebody says, do you believe in evolution? Or when I do a debate on evolution, the first thing I do is define what we're talking about. First of all, we'd have to have cosmic evolution. That would be the origin of time, space, matter. Where did time come from? Where did matter come from? Where did space come from? Did you know all three of those have to come into existence at the same instant? If you had matter but had no space, where would you put it? If you had matter and space but had no time, when would you put it? Hmm? 
you got to get all three coming into existence at the same instant. And God answers that in 10 words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, there's time. God created the heaven, there's space, and the earth, there's matter. God made time, space, and matter all at the same instant. It has to be that way. It's not going to work any other way. Secondly, we have what's called chemical evolution. This is where all of the chemicals evolve from hydrogen. Big Bang Theory says the Big Bang produced hydrogen. Well, then how did we get all these other elements? You want me to believe uranium evolved from hydrogen? Thirdly, we have to have what's called stellar evolution. The stars would have to evolve. You know, nobody's ever seen a star form, and yet there's enough stars out there that we know about. At the last count in 2003, the current estimate is every person on Earth can own 11 trillion stars to yourself. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. <laughs> Fourthly, there's going to have to be organic evolution, where life gets started from non-living material. Nobody has a clue how that could happen. Fifthly, macroevolution, where an animal changes to a different kind of animal. Nobody has ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. But the textbook says we all came from some kind of spineless ancestor. Like this one says, 3.4 billion years old, the remains of the early ancestors of modern human beings. And they show the kids a starfish. Here's Discover, Mag or no, Discover Magazine a couple of months ago. Was your ancestor a sea sponge? <laughs> this is your ancestor. Wow, who's your daddy? <laughs> That's stupid, okay? This textbook says, humans, birds, and crocodiles have a common ancestor. I'm sorry, that's stupid, okay? It's not true, it's lacking normal intelligence. This one says, all the many forms of life on Earth today descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. Oh, we all came from a bacteria, huh, or an amoeba. I'm sorry. That's lacking normal intelligence. That's stupid to believe that. The blue whale grows to 49 tons in one year. Big baby on his first birthday. At that growth rate, growth rate of three, 30 billion times where it started. If a human did that, it would weigh a lot. Okay? <laughs> they say the blue whale evolved from a bacteria. That's stupid. Seahorse is an interesting creature. It's one of the only fish that swims in the upright position. And the male hatches the eggs. How many women think that'd be a great idea? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I like what Dave Reaver says. He said, what this world needs, what, he speaks at high schools all over the country, you know, and he talks to all these public high schools. He said, what this world needs is one pregnant teenage boy. <laughs> That'll slow things down. Um, what did the seahorse evolve from? What's its ancestor? Oh, its ancestor was an amoeba. I'm sorry, that's stupid, okay? Had to be designed. The sperm whale can dive to 10,000 feet and stay there for two hours. The pressure at that depth is 620,000 pounds per square foot. As the sperm whale slowly tried to evolve this ability over millions of years, none of them survived. They all died <laughs> until one of them finally figured it out. And the sperm whale evolved from a bacteria? I'm sorry, that's stupid. There's no kind way to say it, that's dumb, okay? What did the platypus evolve from? It has hair, lays eggs, senses the electrical signals in its prey's muscles. How did he learn to feel the electrical contractions of the muscles of the crawdaddy he's going after? And they say, it, has, it, it nurses its young, it's got a lot of strange features. What was the ancestor of a platypus? Oh, it was, it was an amoeba. I'm sorry. That's stupid, okay? It had to be designed. The bottlenose whale can dive 3,000 feet down in two minutes. A person attempting that would have multiple medical problems <laughs> and die almost instantly, okay? As the bottlenose whale slowly tried to evolve over millions of years, none of them survived. They all died until one of them made it. Who was its ancestor? Oh, it was an amoeba. That's what the kids are going to tell you. That's what the textbooks are going to tell your kids in school. That's stupid. Okay? The rhinoceros beetle, one of them carried 850 times its own weight. That's like me carrying 17,000 pounds. What did the beetle evolve from? Who's its ancestor? Oh, it was an amoeba. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's lacking normal intelligence, okay? I think it had to be designed. 
The giraffe is an amazing animal. Its heart is two feet long. The heart, two feet long. It pumps blood up to the head. When it bends down to get a drink, and then he lifts his head up real fast when he hears a lion, he doesn't faint. You lift your head up 17 feet in about a half second. See what happens to you, okay? <laughs> One atheist said, yeah, the giraffe has long neck so he can reach the trees. I said, no, the giraffe has a long neck so he can reach the ground to get a drink. I mean, he's got long legs too, you know. I mean, what if he evolved the long legs and didn't get the long neck? Huh? <laughs> going to die trying to get a drink. Well, duh. The giraffe has a special network of blood vessels in its head that allow the uh, blood to accumulate around the brain. Instead of blowing its brains out its eardrums, when it bends its head down to get a drink, it absorbs all the pressure. And then when it lifts its head up, it provides two or three more pumps of blood to make sure there's oxygen while he runs away from the lion. Doesn't phase him. Doesn't miss a beat. But now, see, for millions of years, the early giraffes all died because the lion was able to get them until they were trying to figure out how to make this miracle network around the brain. And it evolved from an amoeba. I'm sorry, that's stupid, okay? I think it was designed, okay? The woodpecker's tongue is amazing. When they asked me to do the first debate at the University of West Florida, the debate club said, Mr. Hogan, we want you to send in 30 questions that our professors can use, and they'll supply 30 questions, and you supply 30 questions. And we'll pick them out of the hat, and we'll have the debate over these questions. I said, okay, sounds good. I sent him 30 questions. I said, the woodpecker's tongue goes all the way around the back of his head and anchors either in his left nostril or above his left eyebrow. Now, what did it evolve from? And where's the evidence of its, of its ancestors? That question never showed up in the debate. I don't know what happened to it. But I said, an owl has a cylindrical-shaped eyeball. It's not round. It's like a cylinder, like a tin can. And the owl's eye, kind of like this shape, he cannot move his eyes in his head because it's stuck in the socket. It's like a little telescope. It really is, okay? And when he wants to look at something, he's going to turn his whole head, you know? I mean, if he's looking at you, he's looking at you, okay? Well, <laughs> the owl's eyeball is cylinder shaped. Just about every other bird has a round eyeball, spherical shape, so he can roll it around in his head like you can. So I said in my, in my question, I said, how did, the owl, how did the owl get a cylinder-shaped eye from a spherical-shaped eye? And how did it see in the meantime as it was evolving from round to cylinder-shaped? And where's the fossil evidence of, its, of this happening? Now, that question never came up. Actually, I, I got to thinking by the end of the debate, none of my questions came up. <laughs> I don't know where they put them, but they didn't make it. To the, to, they were gone. But to, Woodpecker's tongue is amazing, okay? He can poke his tongue down in, he, first he pecks a hole in the tree, he listens for the bug crawling around in there, pecks a little hole in the bark, shoves his tongue down there, and then spears it and pulls it back in his mouth. He's got little barbs on the end of his tongue. One guy said, oh, my mother-in-law does too. <laughs> the woodpecker has a special fluid around his brain. While he's beating on that tree, his brain is not bouncing around on the inside of his skull. He's got this special shock-absorbing fluid. How did that evolve? I mean, how did the first woodpecker learn to bang a hole in the tree and stick its tongue down and grab a bug? I mean, how did they learn that? Oh, well, see, Hoven it all evolved from an amoeba. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that's stupid. I'm not going to buy that, okay? The beaver is an amazing animal. It has special feet. It has teeth that wear off on the inside. Did you know, if you look at, you can see them in our museum tomorrow, we've got a beaver skull. The outside of the tooth is really hard enamel, the inside is softer pulp. Every time he chews, it's constantly breaking off the inside of his teeth, which keeps the tooth sharp. Self-sharpening teeth. What did that evolve from? Oh, see, it came from an amoeba. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's stupid, okay? The Pacific golden plover goes to Alaska lays its eggs, puts on 70 grams of fat, then flies 88 hours nonstop to Hawaii. The problem is they burn one gram of fat per hour. They couldn't possibly fly there by themselves. They have to fly in a V formation because the lead bird, like the geese, do the same thing. The lead bird has to use a gram per hour, but all the rest of them get a little savings because they're flying in the wake turbulence. It provides extra lift. So they can fly 88 hours to Hawaii on 70 grams of fat, burning one fat, one gram per hour. Incredible. And then they lay the baby, they lay the eggs, hatch the babies, raise them up to a certain size, mom and dad take off for Hawaii. Great idea, by the way. 
they leave the kids behind. Two weeks later, the babies fly to Hawaii. They have never been to Hawaii. How do they know how to get there? Well, see, they all evolve an amoeba, you know, about <laughs> four billion years. That's just stupid. I'm sorry. That's just not a good way to say it. You know, the dragonfly is incredible. They have the best eyes of any insect in the world. They have 30,000 lenses on their eye. They can see almost all directions at the same time. How their brain figures out what to do with all that information, I don't know. Some people say, I wish I had brains on, or eyes on the back of my head. Do you realize how complicated life would become? <laughs> I like Dennis's question about, what if your knees bent backwards, what would chairs look like? That's a strange thought, you know. <laughs> By the way, I was surprised most of you had never heard of Dennis Swift. I've known him for years. It's just amazing. His head is full of cool stuff. I really enjoy hearing Dennis. He'll be there speaking again tomorrow. Uh, but I've spoken at a couple conferences with him before, and I said, you guys have got to hear Dennis Swift. I think you'd really enjoy that. Dragonfly can fly forwards or backwards, like a helicopter. Unbelievable. You study the flight of a dragonfly, it'll blow your mind. They spend one to two years as larvae before developing into adults. Who was the ancestor of a dragonfly? Uh, well, kids, it was an amoeba. Here we go again. That's what they're going to teach the kids. Now, you may not have your kids in a public school, but your neighbors do. Right? This is your mission field, okay? This is your assignment. Go fix the problem. You might not change the school, but you can convert all the kids. Jesus didn't spend any time trying to change the Roman Empire. He just went after people one by one. They, that's unstoppable. If the Christians would learn to for, forget trying to change the Roman Empire, let's just go after the people. We'll get them all converted, okay? Some amazing videos we offered, amazing creatures, incredible creatures that defy evolution. There's now a third one, one, two, and three. They're on our table out there if you want to get those. Um, by the way, I've been trying to get the uh, author of these amazing creature uh, series to come speak at our boot camp. He's a good friend of mine, and I believe he's going to come to the next one. So pray for that. If we can get Job Martin to come, maybe one of the speakers at the next one. The textbooks tell your kids, 18 or 20 billion years ago, there was a big bang where nothing exploded. It was in a dot, much smaller than a period on a page, and it exploded. That's stupid. Whole universe squeezed in a dot smaller than a period on a page? You couldn't squeeze a Volkswagen into a dot smaller than a period on a page, let alone the whole universe. <laughs> then it all exploded. <laughs> Big bang. Now that's, that's dumb. Where did time, space, matter come from? Who's ever seen a Big Bang create anything? We had a couple Big Bangs over in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Didn't create nothing over there, did it? Big bangs don't create orderly universes. It's stupid. But the humanists believe the universe is self-existing and not created. You see this complex universe and don't believe there was a creator? Well, the second law of thermodynamics says everything gets worse. If you leave things alone for a while, they get worse. Nothing gets better with time. Things devolve. Humanists think the universe is self-existing and not created. Second law says everything gets worse. It had to have a winding up time because it's all winding down. It's not common sense to say it evolved by chance. Evolutionists say, well, if you add energy, you can overcome the second law, and the Earth receives energy from the sun. Yeah, but the universe is a closed system, okay? It's not receiving any new energy just by definition of universe. That covers everything. And adding energy is destructive. You have to have something to use the energy. The Japanese added a bunch of energy to Pearl Harbor and didn't organize a thing for it. A couple years later, we returned the favor and added some energy to a few of their cities and didn't organize a thing. We've been adding all kinds of energy to Afghanistan, trying to find that guy with the diaper on his head and have an organized thing. <laughs> That's how you tell when the terrorists reach puberty, you know, they put their diaper on their head. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Adding energy is destructive. It's not going to organize anything. The sun's energy is going to destroy the roof on your house. The sun's energy is going to destroy your whole house. The sun's energy will destroy your roof on your car. It's going to destroy your upholstery. It's going to destroy the paint job on your car. Only one thing that can use the sun's energy is chlorophyll. No, they say adding energy solves the problem. I'm sorry, that's stupid. Adding energy makes the problem worse for the evolutionist. They, think, they say things are getting better. That's stupid. Here's Sue at 20. Here she is at 90. <laughs> no, things don't get better with time, okay? This one says nothing really means nothing. Now that's stupid. 
Not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorize that from the state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. What? Can you believe they cut down a tree to print that? I mean, come on, where's Al Gore when you really need him, huh? That's what I want to know. That's stupid, okay? Nothing means nothing. Discover Magazine, where did everything come from? Oh, here we go, boys and girls. The universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero, nada. As it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. How is that possible? Ask Alan Guth. His theory will explain everything. Uh, that's stupid, okay? Real stupid. Everything came from just nothing. Yep. The observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. Yep, we all came from a dot, boys and girls. It's then tempting to speculate that, to go one step further back and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. That's stupid. It had to be designed, okay? Time, space, matter had to come into existence at the same time. People say, what did God do before the creation? They say, well, your question assumes that God is locked into time. It's a poor question. There's no answer for it because the question's no good. It's like asking me, why are elephants orange? Uh, they're not, okay? <laughs> and the question, what did God do before the creation, tells me that you're thinking about the wrong God. See, the God that I worship is not affected by time, space, matter. This is not 2005 in heaven. There's no time there. And the angel's going to fly by one day in the book of Revelation, and it says there shall be time no longer. First thing you do, you get to heaven, take off your watch and flip it over to his eye. You won't need that anymore. So before the creation, there was no time, and after God's done with this little experiment, there's going to be no more time. So once upon a time, there was a time when there was no time. <laughs> Think about that one. So everything came from nothing. That's stupid. But that's what the kids are going to be taught in the school. And this is the mission field. Your mission is to seek them out, find them, and give them some common sense. Okay? Open up their mind and pour just a little bit of intelligent thought in there. Okay? Uh, they say this nebula began to rotate. The, the dot began to spin faster and faster. Oh, it was spinning. And finally it exploded. <laughs> Big bang. Well, if you put a bunch of kids on the merry-go-round and get it spinning clockwise as fast as it'll possibly go, you notice some very interesting phenomena. Okay? In phase one, the kids start screaming at the football players, spinning the thing, saying, come on, let's go faster, faster. You get up around 30 miles an hour. Phase two, they stop screaming. <laughs> they just quietly concentrate on trying to hang on. You get up around 60 miles an hour, and they start enter phase three, where they begin screaming again. Only it's stop, stop, please slow down. Don't stop, though. Go faster and faster. At about 100 miles an hour, they go to phase four, where they begin to fly off the merry-go-round. And that's when you notice something interesting. If the merry-go-round is spinning clockwise, when the kid flies off, the kid will be spinning clockwise until he encounters resistance, like a tree or a pole. That's because of a law known as the conservation of angular momentum. A spinning object that breaks apart will have all of the pieces spinning the same direction. It's because the outside's moving faster than the inside. Okay, it's got farther to go. Well, we could talk a long time about that, but if everything began as a swirling dot, everything ought to be spinning the same way, and yet Venus and Uranus rotate backwards. Eight of the 91 known moons in the universe spin backwards. Three planets have moons going both directions at the same time. Some whole galaxies are spinning backwards. CNN ran an article, Goofy Galaxy Spins in Wrong Direction. The Bible says God created the heaven and the earth. Evolution says it all came from a big bang. It spun faster and faster and exploded. I'm sorry, that's stupid. That violates the laws of science. And somebody's got to get some common sense into these kids. Cosmic evolution, that's stupid. It didn't happen. Then the textbook says, as the earth formed, the surface was hot and there was large pools of lava. Well, was the earth really a hot molten mass like the kids are going to be taught? The Bible says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Hmm. Somebody's wrong. Was it a hot molten mass like the textbook says? Or was it underwater like the Bible says? Hmm. Well, Robert Gentry, I'd like to get him to go and speak at our conference one of these days too. He's a good friend of mine from Knoxville, Tennessee. One of the world's experts on the disposal of radioactive materials. Studied granite samples all over the world. He found they have little tiny radio polonium halos in them. 
the polonium has a half-life of from 164 thousandths of a second up to three minutes, depending on which one you're using, to form this little halo in the rock and then freeze it. The rock had to be cold. It was never a hot molten mass. Very fascinating story behind that. To teach that these polonium halos uh, can exist while the rock is molten is ludicrous. It's, if the rock is hot, it may form its little halo, but it's going to disappear. How many of the 4th of July fireworks halos, you know, from the things exploding, how many of them are still up in the sky right now? None. They fell down because the sky is too fluid. These little halos are proof positive the Earth was never a hot molten mass. As soon as Gentry published in all kinds of major science journals until somebody says, hey guys, wait, 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 do you realize what this implies? This means our Big Bang Theory is wrong. They shut him off like a spigot, turned off his grant money, didn't publish any more articles from him. Go to halos.com if you want to get all the lowdown on that one. To say the Earth was a hot molten mass, I'm sorry, the evidence is against that. That's stupid. Now, you might want it to start off that way, but there's a lot of reasons for that. To talk about chemical evolution, everything came from hydrogen. Atoms of hydrogen in the proto-sun fused to form helium. That's stupid. You can fuse them to get helium, but you've got a chicken and an egg problem here. You've got to have the stars to produce the fusion, and you've got to have all the elements to make the stars. Which one came first? One of the questions I asked to the university professors the first time I went out, they never used it. I said, termites chew on wood and swallow it, but they can't digest it. They've got little tiny critters that live inside their intestines. You talk about tiny, we're talking inside the termite's intestines, okay? The termite cannot live without those little critters, and them critters can't live outside the termite. So which one evolved first? And how did it live without the other one? Mm -hmm. They never used that question either. But <laughs> to say all the elements came from hydrogen, I'm sorry, that's stupid. It's, not, it's lacking normal intelligence. It doesn't happen, okay? Fusion can take place, but you got the chicken and an egg problem here. We'll get into that some other time. To say the stars evolved, I'm sorry, that's lacking normal intelligence. God had to design the stars. They're so complex. We could spend two days on the Big Bang Theory, but to say that it happened by chance, Big Bang made a big orderly universe? I'm sorry, that's stupid. Big Bangs make big messes. It's all they've ever done. You know, a star explodes about every 30 years, called a nova, or if it's a big one, they call it a supernova. Why do we have less than 300 supernova rings that have been discovered in the universe? One's exploding every 30 years. That's only a few thousand years worth of stars. They say, well, new stars are forming in Crab Nebula. Don't see those new stars forming right there? No, sorry. New stars are not forming. Nobody has a clue how a star can form. We don't know how a single one of these stars managed to form. Now, if you want to believe they formed, that's fine. I don't care what you believe, but it's not science. Nobody's ever observed a star forming. By the way, we see stars blow up every 30 years. We've never seen one form. Don't you think the births of stars should at least equal the deaths of stars? Aren't we eventually going to run out? I debated a professor one time, and he said, Hoven, I, uh, we were talking about stars forming. I said, don't you know that you've got a problem with Boyle's gas law? Because when you try to squeeze dust together, the pressure and temperature builds up, and it drives it back apart. I said, it would take enormous pressure to squeeze gas into a solid. He said, yes. And we calculated that if 20 stars explode near each other, it would provide enough pressure to make a brand new star. I said, sir, that is brilliant. You have to lose 20 to gain one. I said, you ought to run for Congress. You could help those guys borrow their way out of debt. You think losing a star every 30 years is going to end up getting you 76 trillion stars? 11 trillion per person? I'm sorry, that's stupid. It's not going to work, okay? Planets are cooling off. They can't be billions of years old. Jupiter's cooling off. Ganymede's cooling off. It's hot. It's got a magnetic field. To say it's billions of years old is stupid. Saturn's rings are expanding. They're moving away from the planet. They're losing the rings. It can't be billions of years old. It, to say it is is just stupid. It's not lacking normal intelligence. It's not. The moon is going around the Earth, but the moon is gradually getting farther from the Earth. We're losing the moon a couple inches a year, which means, of course, it used to be, you know, closer. Well, if you bring the moon in closer, you've got a real problem because the moon creates the tides. Some of you folks don't live in Pensacola, and so you don't worry about the tides, but around here you worry about the tides. If you bring the moon in closer, the tides would be much higher. 
There's a law called the inverse square law. If you brought the moon into one third the distance, you inverse the third and square it, it's nine times the gravitational pull. Which means if you run all the math, you'll find out about 1.2 billion years ago, the moon was whizzing around just above the surface of the earth. Which explains what happened to the tall dinosaurs. <laughs> they got mooned. Okay? Um, to teach the moon is billions of years old is just lacking normal intelligence. Okay? It's not common sense. So I believe we have been lied to. I believe we've been told something that's just not true. Now, Arthur Keith, who wrote the foreword to the 59 edition of Darwin's book, said, evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation. The only other choice is creation. If he's right, you know. There was a Russian atheist astronomer who came to America years ago, and he said, start off his speech. Keep in mind, he's an atheist. He said, folks, either there is a God or there isn't. I thought, now this guy, is, he's on to something here. <laughs> Pretty brilliant. And then he said, both possibilities are frightening. I said, wow, what a thought. Either there is a God or there isn't, and both possibilities are frightening. If there is a God, we better find out who he is and find out what he wants and do what he says, because he owns this place, okay? If there is no God, we are in trouble. We're hurtling through space at 66,000 miles an hour, and nobody's in charge. <laughs> That's a scary thought. You believe something because the only alternative involves a creator? Would you believe the painting grew out of the tree because the only alternative involves a painter? Would you believe the watch oozed up out of the sand because the only alternative is a watchmaker? I mean, would you believe the building just assembled from a tornado in a lumber yard because the only alternative is a builder? Nobody with half a brain would reject the idea that there's a painter if you find a painting. You wouldn't reject the idea there's a, building, a builder if you found a building. Why do they reject the idea of a creator when they can see the creation all around them? I do a 90-minute radio program from 4.30 to 6 every day. I just got off in time to rush over here tonight. And we get atheists and skeptics that call in from all over the place. We had one from Sweden yesterday and one from England, and boy, they're angry at me. There's over 1,000 anti-Hovind websites. <laughs> We're going for 2,000 this year. <laughs> they just are angry at the concept that there might be a designer. I was at Berkeley speaking of, talk about a hostile audience. Man, oh man. Uh, I had Q&A time, you know. I do this at universities all the time. It's either Berkeley or University of North Florida. I did what, 12 debates last year. But uh, afterwards, I'm talking to one of the students out in the hallway. He said, evolution is a fact. I said, well, son, just calm down for a minute. I said, let me ask you a question. Suppose the creation story was true. Suppose I'm right. Suppose there's a God. And suppose there are some rules. You know, like thou shalt not, you know. Would that affect your lifestyle any? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, if there's a God, and it is the God of the Bible, and if I'm right, then that means no lying, no cheating, no adultery, no fornication, no pornography, no X-rated movies. I mean, would that affect your lifestyle any? He said, yeah. <laughs> I said, now tell me, son, have you accepted evolution because you've got some evidence for it? Or because you don't like the alternative, a God telling you what to do. He said, I've accepted evolution because I'm horny. I said, thank you, son. Have a seat. Next question, please. Okay. At least he's honest. Last day's scoffers will come and they'll be walking after their own lust. That's the reason they accept evolution. God said, all, the scoffers are going to say, all things continue as they were. No, oh, nothing changes. We cover all that on video four. The Bible says they're willingly ignorant. Willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. Okay? <laughs> they're ignorant of how God made the heavens, plural, heavens, and the earth. We cover all that on video number two. And the world was overflowed and it perished. And the heavens and the earth today are kept in store. God's saving things up for judgment. Read 2 Peter chapter 3. Scoffers are ignorant of the creation. That means God created it. That means there's rules. They're ignorant of the flood. That means God can judge his creation. And they're really ignorant of the coming judgment. 
Julian Huxley said, I suppose the reason we left at origin of species was the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. Well, that's real stupid. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Sorry, that's stupid. God cannot lie. God promised, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that's smart. Amen. 36 years ago, I prayed and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. He said, you can say that again. I said, Lord, I believe you died for me, and I want you to forgive me and save me right now. Have you done that? If you're not sure you're going to heaven, we want to get you signed up. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. The only way you can go to heaven is through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. If you want to hear more about that, stop and see any of our staff with a green shirt. If they don't know how to show you how to be saved, let me know. Well, they'll be picking peaches by tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to boot camp.